Lord, we thank you for your blessing on us, uh, your ministry to us. Oops, sorry about that, about the microphone. Lord, we thank you for your covering. Uh, we just pray for our class, for the, the uh, other students, uh, the other classes, Lord. Just the Easter season, all that it means to us, Lord. We're talking about it tonight, Lord, just what uh, these original disciples thought about you and how they began to share your life. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us now. Keep us well. Keep us focused. Help us, Lord, to learn from you to do tonight. Speak through us to our hearts in your name. Amen. All right. Okay, so uh, gone through the Gospels. We talked about the life of Jesus a little bit. Now we're uh, into the book of Acts, which is... Um, you know, it's called in some, some Bibles, it's called the Book of the Acts of the Apostles. This book is written by Luke. It's, uh, it's the second part of his, his um, communication to Theophilus. And, uh, but the better title might be the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the church. Uh, this really tells about how God's people obeyed God's commission to take the gospel to the whole world. And so, you know, he talks, you know, Luke begins this, in the former account I made, he talked about all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. And then we see in this book just what that, uh, what those miracles and teachings did to a group of people and how that, you know, how that, went from there uh, into their lives and how their lives really changed the world. So we have um, the beginning. We talk about really the authorship of this. So Luke is the author. And um, so the book, Gospels, he had the gospel in this book. And he is a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. He was Greek doctor. So again, throughout this book, you get a little bit of uh, medical uh, information that you don't get from other apostles or other writings at that time. So, uh, when did this occur? Probably in the 60, 61, 62. And the reason we say that's the date is because we know that um, Paul was imprisoned during the reign of Nero uh, as the Caesar of the Roman Empire, as the emperor. And uh, that, that season ended uh, probably in 65. And so if this book was written later than that, certainly Luke would have had the information. Paul uh, winds up at the end of this book in uh, a form of house arrest in Rome. And so he had that season of incarceration. And then later on, he was released and was able to continue his ministry. Another thing that's not mentioned here, which puts the date, which gives us an idea of the date, is the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, the Roman Empire flattened Jerusalem in 70 AD. Uh, it was a military conquest. Uh, unlike other things that happened in the Bible, it was not like Sodom and Gomorrah. It was not like the flood. Uh, the destruction of Jerusalem was a military conquest. And, uh, you know, at that point, uh, you know, that, was, that would also have been, and that happened in 70 so that took, that took a couple of years for them to starve the people, to crucify most of the people, and then to invade the city and tear it apart, you know, really uh, rip it down stone by stone, everything. And then all of the pieces of the temple carried away to Rome, all the, the um, precious things that were in there. So if that had happened, there's no doubt that being the historian that he was, uh, the book of Acts would have included uh, some sort of mention of that. So there's, uh, you know, a lot of kind of legends about what happened to Luke. Some say he was hanged at some point, you know. Being a, uh, a uh, Roman citizen, he couldn't be crucified, but he was hanged apparently. Uh, so again, his audience is this person, Theophilus, which could be a real person or it could be you. It could be any lover of God. That's what the Greek word means lover of God. So, uh, so it was intended to show 
it's, it's a very uh, journalistic, dramatic presentation of the things that happened uh, during this first season of the church. So it's an early record. It's our best, it's our, really our only reliable early record of Christianity. Um, you know, it confirms the faith. He's writing it to confirm the faith that this man or, you know, Theophilus had. And it reveals the church. We see the church in action for the first time in the unity of the Spirit, and then missions, and then really the uh, authentication, the authentication of the apostles, because there's signs and miracles, uh, conversions, preaching, persecutions. These things reveal that the apostles are really related to who Jesus Christ is. So this is the first, you know, this is, these are the first things of the early church. What we've had is Jesus Christ has been crucified. Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. Jesus Christ has appeared several times during the, during the 50 days, during the 40 days, and then he has gone up. He has gone up to heaven. He has ascended into heaven. And now 10 days after, between this period of time after Jesus Christ has ascended, there's going to be this meeting and these, you know, this is the, the first part of this really talks about in detail what the disciples, the apostles, and the others that were connected to the apostles, exactly what they did at the beginning of their ministry. Uh, their teacher, their rabbi, the person they have spent so much time with, the person that they have seen die and they have seen alive again has been taken up from them. So this is like a... Um, you know, what's going on in their hearts and minds is probably a wild thing in their heads, you know. And, uh, you know, what, was he here? Was he really here? It says at the end of one, you know, many saw Jesus and some doubted. You know, is that really him? Is that really him? Uh, and Luke uh, makes the point in the end of his gospel to tell the disciples to handle him. And so that's, uh, you know, the development of the early idea of who Jesus Christ is, is covered in the book of Acts. Uh, so you'll hear some people talk about Jesus as maybe a fine, uh, moral, ethical teacher. He's a powerful figure, a hero of the poor. Uh, but was he uh, God? Was he, did, did, the, did the early disciples really believe he was who he says he was? Or did that develop later on? This is really the argument that people who analyze the Bible as literature and treat it as like mythology and as a developmental doctor, document. You know, the Bible is a developmental document uh, that you know that the the early disciples you know didn't really know who Jesus was. They didn't really think of him. You know what? But Jesus asked very very specifically one time in the Gospels, "What think ye of the Christ? Who is he?" You know, what do you think of the Christ? And, um, you know, and Peter answered that, uh, answered that question. You are the son of the living God. And that's, you know, that's a, a big question. And, and what the, the early apostles thought of Jesus was, was pretty clear. They, they thought of him as a real man. He was not, you know, they, they, they preached him as really, as a real man who walked among them. They preached, you know, they preached about him claiming to be the Messiah and believed in him as the Messiah, the anointed one. And they also saw him resurrected in, you know, it was not just a emanation. It was something, it was real. It was more than just a revival of a body. They had seen several people brought back from the dead, but this was a different kind of, you know, he came back, you know, different you know, because he was bloody and beaten and he came back completely whole with a different, you know, with a real body, but a different kind of thing. So they saw him resurrected. So they did believe him to be a real man. They did believe him to be a, um, uh, the Messiah and they did see him resurrected and they were witnesses of that resurrection. All right, so the main theme of the book of Acts really it's the propagation of the gospel through the power of the Spirit, if you want that in a sentence. So the book of Acts shows us how the Spirit was given and then how the apostles and the people related to them began to share uh, that, um, began to share the reality of who Christ was. So uh, you can pick a lot of verses out, but you know some people say, uh, 
Uh, there's a couple of major verses, uh, but Jesus said here, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. This was going to be their ministry. And um, so Jesus is saying, you know, announce the good news, bring good news. And uh, another key word here is uh, baptism. You know, baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is a spiritual kind of thing that happens, and then the other kind of baptism, which was a testimony of faith. You know, water baptism, spiritual baptism, these kind of things are related in this, uh, in the beginning of this. So, um, now, now the, the first part, how this starts, um, well, let's, let's compare these things first. We'll compare this, the gospel and the gospels and acts. So, in the gospels, we see, you know, Jesus' life expressed for us what he did, what he taught, the things that he said. But now, we're going to see what Jesus continued to do and teach through um, the people. So in the Gospels, we get like the cornerstone of the church, Jesus Christ, and uh, what that is, Matthew 16, Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. We see that the Gospels, the, the story of Jesus, of course, and the reality and the reports of what Jesus, who Jesus was, how he came to earth, his virgin birth, these realities, these are important for us. And uh, that's, that's the history and the historical foundation. But now, you know, we're going to see what this, what this information, when it's energized by the Holy Spirit, what it does to people. And so the origin and the growth of the church is covered in these passages, Acts 2. And then Paul recaps this in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, that this is the origin and how the church begins to spread. All right, so... Jesus said in John 14, 12, this is like maybe in the upper room when he's with all his disciples, he's sitting around, he's going to die the next day, and he says something that maybe the disciples, I'm sure, didn't catch this at all, you know, because they had seen Jesus multiply the loaves and fishes, they had seen him do so many amazing things, they had heard him preach amazing things. He says this, greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father and that he is a pronoun referring to those who believe in me. I'm going to Jesus, and anyone who believes in me, he will do greater works. And so the apostles' works is going to extend beyond Jerusalem to the uttermost parts of the world. Jesus, as a man, was located in one place. You know, he was a real man, so where he was, uh, you know, that's where the activity was. But when he goes to the right hand of the Father, as the sacrifice for our sins, taking the blood of his atonement for our sins, uh, then it's possible now that we can be dwelt with the Holy Spirit. And so as the Holy Spirit fills believers, then the message and the mission of the church can be spread. And this is Matthew 16, 18. This is another fulfillment. I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The message of Christ... Um, is, has you know, proved to be a solid footing for great building that continues. So Jesus preached his, you know, ministered, taught his disciples, sent the Holy Spirit, and the church began to be built by their message by these people. So they are not powerful people. They are not wealthy people. They are seemingly the least qualified people to do this kind of, uh, of mission. Uh, but instead, you know, but with the Holy Spirit active in them, then, you know, the mission will be um, accomplished. All right, so here's a painting. This is the, the, mo the moment when the Holy Spirit uh, comes, tongues of fire upon their head. And that's, you know, that's really the, the real birth of the activity of the church. All right, so the Holy Spirit, this is like the Holy Spirit. What do we know about the Holy Spirit? What are some ideas about the Holy Spirit? This is, you know, this is not, you know, we read a lot about, um, you know, we read a lot about Christ. We read, read a lot about Paul, but we read a lot about the Father. Uh, but what, what about the Holy Spirit? What is, what is the 
thing about the Holy Spirit that, that, that is uh, important to us. Anyone want to talk tonight? It's like... Pardon? He opens the minds to the scriptures. He, oh, yeah, he, he is the, uh, yeah, he is the, uh, in the book of John, he does, it does say that I will send the Spirit to you and he will lead you into all truth. Yes, William. He's our link to communicating with God. Yeah, he's the link to communicating with God. There's two things that's like kind of interesting. There's two things that we're told not to do about the Holy Spirit. Quench not the Spirit. That's one thing. Grieve not the Spirit, we're asked not to do. And the thing about the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer, quench not. Quench not is like don't strangle or don't stifle the persistent flow. All right? So it's possible the flow of the Spirit is into us as believers. It is a reality. It's a persistent flow from the mind of God, from the presence of God into, into our lives. Once we receive Jesus Christ, we are sealed with the Spirit. The Spirit takes up residence, and there's this persistent flow that is trying to make itself, um, that is trying to, uh, by our decisions, trying to help us with our decisions and become uh, a living fountain that flows out of us. So when we quench the Spirit, we are stifling a persistent flow from God. It's eternally persistent. So we are human beings. We have a will. We have uh, a sense of, uh, of, um, of identity. And we can make our choices and our choices to do certain things, to be carnally minded, uh, quenches the flow of the Spirit. And so that's, that's an imp important thing. Another thing that it says is that uh, you know, to quench the spirit is to uh, is to also um, to quench the spirit is to uh, is to inhibit you know the move of God in some way in our lives. Now the other level of that is to grieve the spirit, and grieving the spirit is you know if there's a squen is the, if quenching is related to the flow of power. The grieving is relating is relates to the injury that we can do to our relationship, or the distance that we can put between our relationship to God. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to us. So it says, if you draw near to God, He will draw near to you. That's from the book of James. So uh, the Holy Spirit, when you when you talk about grieving, uh, it, it it really is a relationship word. It's a word you grieve. For people close to you, you if someone who's close to you uh, goes, you know, passes away, there is a sense of emptiness in you. So the Holy Spirit wants to flow through our lives. The Holy Spirit wants to continue to be an active, present um, uh, partner. Or what's? What, I'm not even sure what's. We probably really can't find a word that does it justice in in our human expression but like you know we grieve like that's we grieve we uh, it, it, there's a there's a there's a pain there's a pain in the holy spirit uh there's a there's a sense in the holy spirit of the of pain and um and distance because of some of our actions so so the holy spirit is the is these sources five here effective witness uh miraculous power wisdom in the church administrative authority and uh, and daily guidance guidance so so the effective effective witness miraculous power wisdom in the church administrative authority and guidance these are the things that the Holy Spirit gives so if we quench the Spirit then we don't get this stuff we don't have an effective witness you could go out witnessing in the power of yourself and it could you know seem to be like a lot of fun you know but it, you know is there anything really the 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 key word here is effective witness. If you're out there without the Holy Spirit, then the chances of you doing something or accomplishing something or uh, having somebody come to Christ is, is zero. So, all right, next part here. All right, the book of Acts also is a book with an open end, all right? It just sort of concludes, uh, you know, which means that, means a couple of things to people who study it, like it just ends with Paul in Rome under house arrest and then there's no like sort of tying things together. And that's, you know, it, you know, maybe Luke meant to add to it, 
maybe he did add to it and that piece was never really uh, communicated or circulated the way it, it meant to be. But, you know, this is where he, he ends with the life of Paul. Paul is speaking to people in Rome and uh, that's, you know, that's, that's the end of the book. Another thing you get a lot of people, there's 110 names mentioned in these 28 chapters and nearly 100 facts and, and, uh, and places and details in this book are confirmed by sources outside the Bible. The cities, the travels, the places, the, the rulers, all these things are confirmed by sources outside of the Bible. So, and then as we see the book develop, it's growing and going. The church is growing. The church grows and goes. The Word of God, there's a growth in the Word of God. And then there's the faith in these early believers uh, their faith grows and it goes with them wherever they go. Uh, so, um, you know, so this, is a, this book really is the transitional element from the Gospels, the life of Christ, into the life of the people of God. You okay? Quiet. It's a quiet night here tonight. I know you're all thinking about who's going to win the biggest loser. So I think that's all on your minds, right? Mm-hmm. Well, this one, you know, they're down to three. Will the big guy from Maryland make it? All that kind of stuff. Okay. <laughs> yes. I want to ask a quick question about yeah. the beginning when you open it. Because I've read before that a, Rome, a, a, a Roman citizen, a person who was an uh, actual citizen of Rome but was born there yeah. in Rome, is it the fact that he could not be crucified on a cross, like the way of execution, um, execution, yeah. or or he could not be executed? Period. Or no, they could execute. They could execute. A Roman citizen uh, was not uh, permitted to be crucified because it was a humiliating kind of slow, torturous death that was reserved for uh, other people. But if you were a Roman citizen, you were either hanged or you were um, beheaded hanged or beheaded. You weren't thrown to the uh, animals in the Colosseum. That was another thing that Roman citizens were not. Those were those things that happened. The gladiator games were usually um, prisoners uh, or, or foreigners who were prisoners of war. So, all right, next. Okay, the book of Acts. We see a development of how this eternal movement became, came to be known. Like at the beginning, it's the way, you know, and there is like a group out there called the Way International that has sort of a contorted view of scripture. So if you find some information about them, you might, you might, and you start reading it, it might seem good, but there's some places where they start deviating about the deity of Christ and stuff. Uh, But, you know, this is, uh, this is, this is the way. That's what it's, this is a new way that they're going, a new path. It's a new road of living. And then this is like more of a, um, later on in the book of Acts, it's the sect of the Nazarenes. It's like, you know, Jesus came from Nazareth. Nazareth is a town that didn't have such a good reputation. So these group of, this group of people that believes in Jesus is really just a, a sect of, Naz- of the Nazarenes. It's a part of, you know, they were Jewish. The, the people who were managing the temple in Jerusalem would agree that these are Jewish brothers and sisters, but... They belong to a different kind. They're a, they're a close-knit group who follow this guy from Nazareth. And uh, we would say that they're a band of brothers and sisters, a new band. And then finally, Acts 26, you know, they're Christians. You know, in Antioch, they are called Christians. And earlier in the book, they are called Christians. Uh, but that's the way it, that's this, the name evolves. Like, how does this, you know, at the beginning, it's just like, what is this way that they're going? It's not, it's a different way. And, uh, you know, and so these things develop through the book, the different names, and how they became to be called Christians. Um, now, the other part of this is there's the the the, the developments of the um, uh, the geographic, like it covers the geographic part of this Jerusalem to Antioch, Antioch to Ephesus and Rome. These places became this is these became the center of the church. By the end of the book of Acts, Jerusalem uh, will be the place where James lives and some of the apostles, but most of the apostles have been moving out into other places according to the uh, command of Jesus Christ to them. 
And so Jerusalem will not remain the center of Christian life. They will move out of there. Antioch will be much closer to uh, the roads and the places where the new churches are being developed. And then eventually, because of the capital city and the commerce, the, the commercial center that Rome will become as the empire develops, then that, that's where the Christian church will finally settle. And we still have a, a large piece of the Christian church. Nominally speaking, uh, the Roman Catholic Church is still based in a little piece of Rome called the Vatican. And so that's where it's been based there for these, uh, these um, decades, you know, or centuries really now, centuries. So when it finally gets there towards the uh, uh, 300, I guess 300 A.D. is when the church really settles in Rome, when the Roman emperor decides that Christianity is the approved religion, then it becomes settled there. So the next thing is that this, is, this becomes, at the beginning you just have a very Jewish band of people. You know, very, you know all of them are Jews. And, uh, but then uh, the, next, the next ministry through, we see this happen quickly in the book of Acts. The next ministry is to the Samaritans, uh, the next, the next uh, territory over, and then to the nations. So we see God moving in these, uh, you know, setting up specific incidents to get these, to get these, uh, to get the disciples, to get the uh, disciples out of Jerusalem and on the road to, to the uttermost parts of the world. Um, so we have... Um, the uh, a biographical d development in the terms of Peter and Paul. These are two people we see their leadership roles early developing here. Peter in the first part of Acts and then the latter part of Acts, we see the, you know, Paul becoming the, the uh, central force in the ministry of the gospel. I mean, and it's not a, it's not a thing that Paul, Paul exalts in in terms of pride, but he does become the effective uh, carrier of the gospel to all of the parts of the Roman Empire outside of Judea. So Peter has, you know, Peter was told that he would have the keys. You know, Jesus said, you will have these keys. And Peter does open the door uh, with, uh, you know, when he preaches to the Jews, and then he opens the door to the Samaritans, and then also uh, to the Gentiles. There's three situations. So um, the ministry, uh, you know, Peter is used... Uh, to open all these doors to, for the ministry, and then Paul uh, drives on. Later on, Paul will take the ministry to the Gentiles far and wide. And then this theological development, these next development is like the ascension of Christ, where he goes, what he does, uh, the descent of the Spirit, and the extent of the gospel. The, you see in here, in the sermons that we have in the Acts, we have a real clear idea of the kind of of evangelistic message that that they were presenting, you know, uh, Jesus Christ was a man. Jesus Christ came to die. He died on a cross. It's like that was like that. You know what? You know the guy that you claim to be the Messiah died on what? So you, you're thinking about like we see this, you know, we see the cross in a whole different way in this day and age. When you're talking about someone on the cross, you're talking about someone tacked up there with nothing on, left there for a couple of days, you know, really just, you know, it was the, it was the most embarrassing, brutal way to die. And uh, yet, it's, it's not something, it's, it's something that immediately the apostles, the, the immediate, immediately their sermons focused on this idea that yes, yes, the person that we worship um, died like a common criminal. He was, he was nailed up there like a common crane. He was there for all to see, you know, out there outside of Jerusalem. We're not denying that. And, and, but they start to say, you put him there to the Jews. You put him there. The Romans put him there. But we know him in a new way because we have seen him on the other side. We have seen him outside of the grave. He has come out of the grave, and we are uh, his, uh, his servants. We are his servants, and we are... You know, so this is the development, like, where did Christ go? And so you don't get any of the, um, you know, we don't get any of the theological development in this, in this uh, account. 
you know, any kind of, we don't see how, there's only one certain point where we see the, uh, where the, there's one certain um, conflict that has to be settled theologically, and that is the, the one conflict that does a person have to become Jewish before he can be a Christian? And that's a big thing. All, it doesn't take very long before some people and their roots of bitterness and their roots of um, uh, prejudice begin to exercise these things. These people cannot follow Jesus unless they first become Jewish. And that meant for men's circumcision. You know, and unless people become circumcised and become followers of Moses, they cannot be followers of Jesus. And, you know, this, this quickly becomes a dispute, and there's a, there's a large vocal group of people who, who want to maintain their, um, you know, their uh, traditions, and they want to maintain their identity as the, the core of this movement. And then, there, so there's a meeting there, and that is one theological thing. That's really the only theological thing that's settled. That no, a Gentile, a Greek, any kind of person from any other part of the world who's not related to the people of, of uh, Abraham, they do not have to become Jewish. They do not have to go through that process to become a Jew in order to become a Christian. And so that's the one theological thing that's sort of dealt with here in the book of Acts. Everything else in the, next, in the epistles, from the epistles on, from Romans to Jude, we get uh, the idea, the development of the idea of uh, who God is, the atonement, what Christ, what's Christ's death really meant, what his resurrection really meant. All those things are left for Paul, Peter, James, John, uh, and, uh, and Jude to explain to us in the coming and, and the book of Hebrews. So, but here we don't get that. We just get really just like a, a real, um, you know, blow by blow description, very accurate, um, accurate account of how the early church developed and how it began its mission after Christ left. Okay, so, so we could break it down into three pieces. The church is formed, the church transitions into a world mission organization, and then the church expands as that mission is fulfilled in different groups of people. So you could say that um, there's three uh, major elements of origin re regarding divine activity on the earth, okay? And these are the way they are. Okay, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The origin, it's ideal, like God spoke it, and it was perfect. It was ideal. And, um, you know, it was, it, it, there was potential for it to remain perfect. And uh, now it's actually and effectively imperfect because it lost its, it lost its, uh, um, it lost its, uh, its head. When uh, man sinned in the garden, the head of creation was was uh, fell, and so now creation groans because it does not have its authority. The man was supposed to dress and keep the garden. The man was supposed to be the king of the earth and uh, with his queen, serving, caring for the earth, being fruitful and multiplying, recognizing being a good steward, listening to the voice of God, and walking with him. So originally, it was ideal but now effectively and actually it's imperfect. It's not, you know, because of that act. Okay, now the incarnation is different, okay? Now don't be thrown off by this word. I'm saying the origin is imperfect or unfinished, okay? When Jesus came out of Mary's womb, he was not, you know, he was not six foot two, 210 pounds with a beard and long hair. You know, ready to be a carpenter. He did not come out and say, here I am. I'm ready to build a few tables with my dad and then go to the cross. It's not the way it happened. It's like Jesus came out as an infant, as a babe who had to be wrapped in swaddling clothes. That's why I say he came out, he did not come out, he came out immature. He came out unfinished. He had a life to live. The original creation 
was perfect, but it fell when man fell. Jesus came uh, immature, unfinished, and the work of his life and his death and his resurrection accomplished perfect humanity. All right? So this is the miracle of the incarnation. Jesus was virgin born, virgin conceived. He was born and he was given to Mary and Joseph and they had to raise him. You know, they had to care for him. He had to be fed. He had to have his diaper changed. All those things happened to Jesus. Jesus was a real man. He had a diaper. All right? Just, you know, I mean, the picture. He did not come out, you know, whole and complete. So he had to live this life and we only see one little glimpse of him from infancy to the baptism of John. We see that little piece in the, in the early in the book of Luke, early in the gospel of Luke, where he uh, is lost in Jerusalem and his parents have to go and find him. So the incarnation, the beginning of divine, this, per, this part of divine activity began uh, without maturity, without uh, with a, without the finished work, Jesus had to finish the work. God entered humanity to finish the work, and he took two. Uh, when he w went up here in the first chapter of Acts, when he went up, what he brought to heaven was perfect humanity, which wasn't there before. So there was something that was not in heaven that Jesus brought with him after he was resurrected. It was perfect humanity and his blood. Now the church... This again, now the church is, you're going to see the church and it's going to start out like totally ideal. It's like the Holy Spirit falls, the people preach, people get saved. But very quickly, uh, human beings start to mess with it. And we, you know, we see things happen. And it's, you know, there's a potential for perfection, but we know how human beings are. And so actually and effectively imperfect. Like creation, so you can look at, you know, the church as a microcosm of all of creation. God created creation perfect, and he put Adam and Eve in it, and, you know, and there was a fall, and there was some, you know, you know, God created the church perfect with the movement of the Holy Spirit, but people quench the Spirit, people grieve the Spirit. People quench the Spirit, people grieve the Spirit. People quench the Spirit, people grieve the Spirit. There's troubles, there's activity, there's lying, there's deceitfulness. There's struggles. There's even, you know, there's even trouble between um, men of God. You know, the Bible is very good at showing us just, you know, there's trouble between Barnabas and Paul. They have an argument about somebody, and, the, and they go different ways. It's like they separate, you know. It's like Paul goes that way, and Barnabas goes that way. Paul takes this guy with him, and Barnabas takes this guy with him, and we don't hear about Barnabas ever again. And like, you know, but, and the Bible just lets it, Let's it lay there for us to think about, you know. Peter and Paul, you think Peter and Paul have a dispute about something, and Paul has to correct Peter. Well, wait a minute, you know, Peter was the guy who walked with Jesus three years and all that. Paul just saw Jesus from the sky. You know, how can Paul correct Peter? But it happens. It's talked about in the book. So the church is, is, effectively, is effectively imperfect. I think you know that, right? Right? We have days when the church is not you know, we have days when the Holy Spirit, the power is really sensed and there's no quenching, there's no grieving the Spirit and its thing. So when divine activity, so this is the beginning of divine activity. We have Genesis, the beginning of divine activity. We have Matthew and Luke where we get the stories of Jesus' incarnation and his virgin birth. That's another point of divine activity. And now we're seeing the third story of divine activity, origin of divine activity here in the book of Acts. When the Holy Spirit comes and the church is formed by that. Okay? How you doing? All right. So here's, the, uh, here's how it happens. Christ ascends. The Spirit descends. And then things happen pretty quickly. There's a deliverance. There's a discipline. There's an expansion of leadership roles. And then there's death. How do you like that? You get there very quickly. The Spirit's moving fast, and things are happening. You know, the, first, the, the, the disciples are put into prison, and they're delivered out of prison. Ananias and Sapphira in chapter 5, they lie to the Holy Spirit, and there's discipline. What happens? Death. Bang. You lied to the Holy Spirit. Why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? What are you trying to do? Trying to make ourselves like evangelical heroes. It's like, 
If we do this right, we could have a mega church. It'd be awesome. Ananias and Sapphira, co-pastors. It'd be cool, you know? <laughs> it's like, it's not so far. You know, they saw Barnabas had sold a piece of property and given all of the money to the, to the disciples, and he was, like, considered, like, a hero. And, you know, it's like, wow, look what, what happened. If we do this, this would be amazing. We'll be the great husband and wife team. And so that's the first discipline. When there starts to be, like, details of life in the operation of this ministry and this mission, the apostles recognize their place to give themselves to the hearing of the Word of God, the preaching of the Word of God, the ministry of the Word, and to prayer. And so this is where we get these ideas of deacons. And this is where you start getting the idea of the church and the leadership are working together because it happens this way. Um, you know, there's, there's some money coming in. They're caring for each other. They would like, their, you know, something's happening and it's, there's some sort of dispute going on. Like, okay, the, this group of people, is, this group of widows is not being cared for the way this group of widows. And so the people bring this to the apostles. It's like it's really kind of interesting that this is the way the church was working at that time. Is the apostles, there isn't like a clear, defined leader of the 12. They're all there. Peter, I'm sure, is the most accomplished, and he's probably speaking the most. But when, they, when the church has a problem, they bring it right to the men. They say, we need some help with this. And then the men said, okay, you pray. You bring us some names, and we will lay hands on them, and they will serve you in the details of life. Us, we will, listen, we will be uh, acquainted with the Word of God. Now remember, unlearned fishermen, most of them, wild guys, wild children, not really used to this. They're starting to read the Old Testament, and they're starting to recognize some things, you know, more than they ever did before. And they're recognizing some of the connections that Jesus is. You know, Jesus is like, oh, Jesus is this servant from Isaiah. Look at what it says about it here in Isaiah 53. This, the elevation of Isaiah 53 really comes from the apostles because they gave themselves to the reading of the Word of God and to prayer, and the deacons and the servants got to do the nitty-gritty kind of things. But the deacons and the servants, who's the first guy who dies? He's a deacon who knows how to preach the gospel. So the deacons may have had like, you know, they may have been uh, handling uh, details and distributing things to the poor and everything like that, but they knew the Bible too. They were being taught by the apostles. They were out in the uh, community witnessing, and then we know the story. You know, we'll get into it a little bit more detail later on. But So this Christ ascends, he goes up, he sends the Spirit, and then there's the first deliverance, the first discipline, the first deacons, and the first death, all in the first seven chapters of this book. And uh, there's three um, major conversions that happen during the transition here that happens in, the, uh, in, the, um, in this. So we have, and they all relate to these three sons of Noah. So it's kind of interesting how the Bible keeps itself in order. And you see there's the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, he's a son of Ham. So... Uh, he is one by Philip's ministry. Saul of Tarsus is a, son, is a son of Shem. He's one. And then also Cornelius, an Italian, he's a son of Japheth. He's, you know, these transition, in this transition period, we see these different men, uh, you know, um, brought into the, uh, you know, brought in by the Spirit of God to the, to the mission, to the ministry. And so we have that happening. We have the conversions, these conversions that happen. They're defined for us in the book of Acts. And then you have the persecution, the stoning of Stephen, the killing of James, who is the brother of John, not the brother of Jesus. And then uh, there is the jailing of Peter. So this is, you know, after, the, after Jesus goes up, there is, this, there is this, this shaking period, this transition, things settling in. Things are, are not so neat and tidy. Yes, Kevin. Jesus' brother. The book of James is written by the brother of Jesus. Jude is written also by a brother of Jesus, 
a son of Mary and Joseph, but not a son of the Holy Spirit. I mean, in the, in the physical sense. You know, the Holy Spirit conceived Jesus, but the Holy Spirit, you know, is in James and is in Jude and communicates the words that become their letters for us. But, but this is, you know, these are the transition. This, this, these seven, these beginning chapters of this show how fast the Holy Spirit, we see this many people getting saved, we see this happening, and then it's interesting that each of these three conversion um, events are defined for us because, you know, we could say that, you know, after the flood, there is this moment when, you know, there is this moment when, you know, what's going to happen? All there is is like just Noah, his wife, and three sons and their family. What's going to happen? You know, and now God is like really sort of, you know, he's done a different thing. He's done a different cleansing work in terms of what he's done at the cross. And then it, it's, it's right back to the sons of Noah. We got this, this son, this son, this son. And now the, uh, God is like bringing them all in for this. Let's see, all right. So where are we here? Let's see. Okay. All right, 7 o'clock. We're going to take a break before we get into the church in expansion. So we've gone through the church in transition, the church, uh, the church forming and then the church moving into this transition period. Now we're going to see, talk about the church in expansion. And we'll get into all of the, uh, the details uh, about the apostles and these kind of things in the next section of the class. All right, so take 10 minutes and come on back. <clears throat> 